no seats and the like. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, we've actually received a lot of, um, of information in terms of uh, research aims and thinking about late stage and young uh, colorectal cancer survivors in the last couple of months. And we were just want to remind everyone that Fight Colorectal Cancer is very much an advocate of funding science and research. So since 2006, we do have a dedicated fund where 100% of the funds are donated to late stage colorectal cancer research to some aspiring uh, scientists who might not otherwise be able to uh, garner resources from groups like NCI, NIH, who are doing some really fantastic work. So you'll see in this, uh, this updated um, slide is that we've really grown over the last uh, several years, and we really aspire um, to the 2012-2014 to be at a $100,000 mark um, to make sure that we, uh, again, continue to promote uh, clinical research um, and really advance uh, uh, quality of life and treatment of colorectal cancer. So to learn more, to donate, we also have our, our um, it's mentioned on our website, and just as always, just a, um, a quick reminder is that we, um, the webinar series and all of the information we put forth, we do our very best to give timely and correct information, but this is no way in replacement um, of what you receive in terms from medical care or from a medical professional. Um, we hope to help supplement and provide additional materials. And just, of course, a reminder that if there's ever an emergent situation, a call 911. And with this, I just also want to just uh, remind everyone there will be an opportunity to uh, type in questions today. Uh, Kevin McAbee, who's a member of our team, will be helping us facilitate some of that discussion later in the webinar. Unfortunately, we can't um, ask our presenters or fight CRC staff to, to provide direct medical um, advice, but just some general um, questions or things that we definitely can do. But if there's something very specific about your specific treatment or surgery, what have you, we do ask that you recommend um, that you speak to your healthcare provider. Um, so with that, um, we're very excited today to have, again, uh, two speakers. Uh, Dr. Margaret Martin will be really talking about the nutritional aspect of um, colon cancer and thinking a little bit as we're coming to the season um, and even as we come into the spring about health, healthy habits. Um, Dr. Um, Waller will be joining us as our second speaker who's a colorectal cancer surgeon who will actually be talking a little bit further about the bowel obstruction um, and we're excited to have both of these speakers and we actually decided Dr. Waller would be a perfect person to help continue this discussion as he did a farting blog that actually received a lot of fun acclaim um, and we, we definitely see him as someone who um, can definitely educate and connect with our uh, with our uh, team as well as our people who are looking for resources. So before we begin with Dr. Waller, we're going to have um, Margaret Martin, who is a licensed dietitian um, and nutritionist from the state of Tennessee, and she's of course um, certified specifically as a diabetes educator, which we think also important because there is um, a lot of cross overlap in terms of management of chronic condition. And uh, Margaret actually attended um, the University of Alabama in terms of thinking about a nutrition and science background and from the University of Tennessee where she was um, really able to delve into nutrition science and public health. She has more than 10 years of experience in clinical nutrition and has worked in the insurance um, industry with WellPoint, Blue Cross, uh, thinking about nutrition consultation services and web-based nutrition education. So um, we really are excited. Um, she's done a lot of also very formative and good work um, as volunteer with Lung Force Walk in Middle Tennessee. Um, but we're really excited because we um, are really excited about being able to partner with other agencies as they provide more information um, and that helps our team as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and have um, Margaret um, take over and talk a little bit about Pearl Point and the resources that they add. And just as a quick reminder, um, please tape in any sort of questions, any comments, um, and Kevy will be manning that. Um, I do also want to give a special thanks to Micah Sol Michael Sola, who's uh, part of our Fight CRC. C team, our VP, who's really helped with a lot of um, making sure that our webinars and our series uh, for patients are really top notch. So, Margaret, I will let you take over from here. Thank you. Andy? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, and Margaret. Uh, Let's see. Okay, so, Margaret, we are waiting for your PowerPoint to come up, but you should be able to run your slides when that uh, PowerPoint is up. Thank you. I had it up and then I put it down again, sorry. <laughs> Let me try this one more time.
Just a minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity today to be with you and talk about nutrition. Um, before we talk about some nutrition strategies, I'd like to spotlight Pearl Point Cancer Support. We're a not-for-profit organization founded over 25 years ago, and we provide personalized guidance, education, information about treatment and support on our website, and we deal with both survivors and co-survivors, and it's uh, free of charge. So check out our website, My Pearl Point, after our discussion. Oops. Sorry. Uh, just to let you know, we have three objectives for our presentation on nutrition. One is to talk a little bit about the colon, the job of the colon in nutrition, uh, let you know some nutrition steps to take to help you through treatment, and also to learn about some holiday tips to help reduce your risk of obstruction. Now, uh, the colon is not something we think about very often unless something goes wrong, uh, but it does have a very important role in our body and nutrition. It's actually one of the larger organs of our body, about six feet in length. It's known as the large intestine as well. And then the rectum is the last six or 12 inches. So the colon does finish the final step of digestion. Uh, it turns, in other words, our food into energy and strength uh, so you can enjoy your day. It also helps absorb important nutrients and fluid and it balances nutrition for your life and to keep it energetic and have a strong defense for immunity. And of course, it prepares for our waste for elimination. So we don't usually appreciate our colorectal organ until our health changes. And of course, if our colon's not happy, then our nutrition and immunity are usually not, not happy either. Now, thinking about nutrition and colorectal cancer, um, of course, cancer itself, as well as surgery, can trigger, trigger digestive issues that maybe you didn't have before. And then treatment on top of cancer can also cause these digestive issues, such as diarrhea, constipation, gas, bowel obstruction. And these can, if they impact your appetite and ability to eat, can actually trigger malnutrition. And of course, mal malnutrition is um, not we don't want that to occur during treatment because that can delay your treatment or even cause your treatments to be decreased. So we want to keep everyone in tip-top shape during their treatment. But I just wanted to reassure you that digestive issues are very treatable. And to go ahead and start the conversation with your doctor and healthcare team if you're having issues like diarrhea or constipation. Um, especially try to keep a side effects log, including what you're eating, and share that with your, your team. Well, when we talk about nutrition and cancer, we would like to start to, to the conversation before surgery. So if you know you're going to have surgery, uh, three things to kind of keep in mind. One, grab nutrient-rich foods, and we'll go into this in just a minute. Uh, number two, try to stir in extra protein sources and extra vitamins and minerals where you can and what you're already eating. And number three, sip on supplemental liquids um, if that's appropriate for you. We always want you to follow your surgeon and uh, your pre-op team's instructions for any surgical prep. Uh, we're just giving some suggestions today just to let you know that. But talking about choosing nutrient-rich foods, uh, nutrition facts labels can be very important because some things are very confusing when it comes to nutrition. Um, the words natural and organic may or may not be related to the actual amount of nutrients in the food. One easy way to know what's really in the food is, for instance, if you're looking at protein or vitamins or calcium, you can look on the nutrition facts label and if that food item has 20% more of that nutrient per serving, then you know that's a high nutrient food or a great source of that food. Now, thinking about, secondly, stirring in extra nutrition into your food, this is an easy way to fortify your, fortify your foods without spending a lot of extra money, effort, or 
uh, energy to do that. You're simply going to try to stir in some high nutrition add additives to your foods like cereals, gelatins, beverages, soups, or creamy items like mashed potatoes or casseroles. These can be um, high nutrient things you can get at the grocery store like egg white powders, uh, dry milk powder. You can use uh, baby food, meats even, to stir into food to get extra protein and iron. And of course, then you also can buy the medically commercial protein powders or maybe a liquid daily multivitamin that your pharmacist could get for you, with your doctor's approval, of course. Um, now, what should we do after surgery? This is a very important time. It's also a time when you don't always feel very well. Um, so just know that it takes time for your colon to heal. Just if you had broken an arm, it would take weeks for that bone to heal back. So you're, it's true for your colon as well. Um, we get a lot of requests for a diet after colon surgery, but really there's not just one diet for colon surgery. You'll be working with your physician and perhaps even a registered dietitian who will help you with the correct diet. Often nutrition progresses from nothing by mouth after surgery to ice chips to liquids and then finally to solid foods. And that might be a one to two month process depending on um, your particular surgeon's protocol. Well, what can you do to be proactive after surgery to reduce your risk for obstructions? Of course, one thing to do is to ask for a printed meal plan or diet while you're in the hospital or even when you're in uh, the pre-op area or with your physician. Um, if you have a lot of special nutrition needs or allergies, it's always great to ask to meet with a registered dietitian on staff. They're, they're often employed here at the hospital or in the community. And don't forget about fluids. Lots of times people don't think fluids are important, but especially after surgery, it's important to keep your hydration. You'll start off probably with ice chips and advance to clear liquids, things you can see through, uh, decaf, coffee, tea, sodas, gelatins, and then finally the full liquids. Uh, liquids help carry the medications that you need for healing, and they also help release the nutrients in your body. So don't forget about them. Well, what about when you get to the stage where you're going to be actually having food to eat? Um, one recommendation is to go small. Uh, small meals are, are easily digested by your colon, so your colon will do a much better job than a, than a large meal. Um, digestion really starts in your mouth with chewing, so be sure to chew each bite well to uh, release the nutrition. Also, think about choosing fuel, fuel or food frequently through the day. Instead of eating two meals a day, aim for four to six small mini meals a day. Frequent nutrition or fuel helps fight fatigue and combat mood swings that can happen sometimes when you're going through the stress of surgery. Uh, regular meals can also promote, help promote regular bowel movements and regular physical activity, whether it's just walking in the house or walking uh, to try to cook or uh, clean up the kitchen. And of course, have a goal for your fluids. Some people aim for 10 to 12 ounces of fluid every three to four hours. So make out your fluid plan. After surgery, the most important item of nutrition that we get questions about is what about fiber after colon surgery? Um, fiber is usually introduced uh, after your doctor is, uh, is well assured that you're digesting your fluids well. There are two types of fluid uh, fiber, excuse me, uh, soluble fiber that thickens the stool and then insoluble fiber which is not digested but it does give your stool bulk. Uh, so in the beginning, you want to avoid fiber and have very low levels of fiber, but these two types of fiber do work differently in your body for health. Once you're able to have fiber, do spread it out throughout the day, small amounts at each, at each feeding. Um, now, I think some confusion arises sometimes as we think of fiber as very healthy and being preventative, which is true before surgery, 
but after surgery, you do want to read your labels and be able to know where fiber is. Um, low fiber is often defined as less than a half a gram or two grams per serving. Many people uh, three to six weeks after surgery might not be on a low, low fiber diet, which might be 13 grams a day or less, just to let you know. Low fiber means low stress. Uh, on your surgical area and digestion can be fully achieved to help you get all the nutrition you need. And just to have a high risk list, things you should try to avoid after surgery, that would be nuts, seeds, pulp, peels, uh, strings that might be coming from uh, raw vegetables. These are all insoluble fiber and you would not want to use those. Now, everyone always wants a list of what are some good low-fiber foods. This is just a partial list. Um, there is a list on the Fight Colorectal uh, website, a link for a nice list. On our website, My Pearl Point, we also have uh, low-fiber, low-residue menus. But generally, low-fiber foods are uh, often refined, like white bread instead of wheat. Uh, cereals that are plain without nuts or fruits in them. Your vegetables uh, will be cooked and your meat will also be cooked. And your desserts, which will be great for holidays, could be things like angel food cake, yogurt, pudding, and icy. Now that we're coming along to the holiday, what are some tips to help us uh, reduce your risk of obstruction while you're celebrating? Of course, number one is choose low fiber foods. You know, know what foods are on your, your foods that are allowed. Uh, do hydrate throughout the day. If you become constipated, sometimes um, not drinking enough can be a trigger for that, and constipation is, can cause too much pressure on your colon after surgery. Do eat every three to four hours. Enjoy what you eat, especially at the holidays. You might get to taste some food you haven't had since last year. So do explore a little bit. And keep a log that you can review about any digestive issues, issues you may have and any foods you haven't, haven't taken in that day. And also ask for help or seek help from friends and family, neighbors for meal planning, cooking, or even going to the grocery store for you. And that will let you save your energy for the holidays. Um, some other tips might be uh, have good posture when you're eating. Good posture and chewing each bite well just helps your colon have a much easier job to do. Uh, know what the high-risk foods are when you go to a party or to a, a dinner so you can avoid those. Uh, also, watch out for those spicy foods, which can also cause gas, uh, as does chewing gum and using a straw. Gas in your system can also cause too much um, pressure in your colon and be very stressful. Uh, if your doctor agrees, set goals to get active. Maybe start with a three or five minute walk inside the house. Walking helps also support regularity in your bowel movements. And do try to trim or avoid alcoholic beverage and caffeinated beverages during the holiday season. There are a lot of decaffeinated beverages and non-alcoholic beverages that are really fun and colorful. Just try to choose from those. Now on our website, My Pearl Point, we do have an opportunity for you to sign up and get your own dashboard. A dashboard is just a summary or a starting point for you, and it lets us be able to show specific personalized information for you. We do have a new colorectal cancer handbook for survivors and co-survivors. It's very popular, as well as our um, side effects log. Also, we have a uh, free cancer side effects mobile app from Google Play or iTunes for your smartphone, so don't miss that as either. That's great to have with you in treatment or if you're having uh, side effects and you're not sure uh, what to do about that, like nausea, diarrhea, constipation. Um, some additional resources just to let you know, of course, are my pro point website, fightcolorectalcancer.org. Uh, Cancer.gov is the National Cancer Institute, and they have some great resources and food lists and meal plans 
their book, Eating Hints Before, During, and After Cancer Treatment, is really a good one to have on hand. Cancer.org is the American Cancer Society, and they have a great list of low-fiber foods. Oncologynutrition.org is the dietetic practice group I belong to. And then, of course, the American Institute of Cancer Research is a, a very good food nutrition website. So thanks so much for letting me be a presenter today, and I look forward to any questions you have a little bit later on. Thank you so much, Margaret. I think we really all enjoyed um, that information, and I think there was a question in the browser about how do we access this, these um, information and, and share it. We definitely encourage everyone to go ahead and, and share this information and uh, put it forth to friends, family, or even support groups. So the information will be saved on our uh, website at Fight Colorectal Cancer. Um, so with that now, in terms of the introduction um, with Dr. Waller, James Waller, um, I'd just like to say I think right now we have just the intro slide up and we're uh, moving to his bio here in just a sec. Um, but I do want to just mention that um, Dr. Waller and his wife Krista have done uh, a whole lot in terms of uh, fight colorectal cancer advocacy initiatives and even uh, some of their own independent work. And so he's been an amazing advocate, um, someone who's worked well um, with our team. And Dr. Waller, thank you so much for joining in, especially given your um, busy schedule. And um, just a quick shout out to Margaret. I really think that the Pearl Point resources um, are fantastic. We definitely want to promote and cross-promote um, what each of the organizations bring to the table um, in terms of the different types of resources and tools. So thank you so much for sharing those resources because I think that's exactly what um, our community needs most of all. Um, so we're going to go here and I want to try to um, actually get to Dr. Waller's uh, bio. Can we, can we um, move there really quickly? Yes, I'm moving there. Um, one of the Okay, perfect. Um, so just in a quick reminder to you, um, after we will be asking um, after the um, email, or excuse me, after the webinar, um, a survey on how we did, um, what information was helpful, um, and then any other questions that you might have that we can actually follow up in a post-blog uh, follow-up. So um, just want to remind you all that that's definitely something that's coming in. We take the input um, that you guys provide very, very seriously and try to augment and make sure that we have the best resources. So make sure and fill that out. So with Dr. Waller, he um, is a native of Evansville, Indiana. Um, he, inter uh, he is a, a medical doctor who went to med school at Indiana University and his internship at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. He did a residence, um, residency in general surgery and colorectal surgery from Michigan at Betterworth Hospital and Ferguson Hospital, respectively. He's a board certified American. Uh, he's a, he is board certified by the American uh, Board of Surgery and the Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery. And in 1986, Dr. Weller joined uh, Dr. Chris uh, Dosek in practice at Ohio Valley Colon and Rectal Surgeons. And outside of that. Um, he definitely enjoys playing ice hockey and, and softball, and you can tell from his picture that he's definitely a, a very spirited advocate and someone who's been um, very much involved in our work here. So Dr. Waller, thank you so much for joining us today, and we're ready to talk about obstructions if you are. Thank you. Uh, lost my slide. Let's see. What do I have to do to get back to... If you can just click forward on the slides, you should be able to get to your slides. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, this is, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, I've been in uh, the practice of colorectal surgery since 86-87, uh, so I've been around for a little bit. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of the four colorectal surgeons in our group. Uh, not to bore everybody with this, but I'm quite proud of our group. Uh, this picture actually was taken from the Ripple Effect uh, colorectal cancer uh, fundraising event that we had at Lake George this past year, um, and uh, I was one of the, I participated in a, uh, uh, a relay distance run around the lake uh, while uh, Andrew uh, Houdon uh, swam the distance to the lake, which was 32 miles, and this was all in an effort to raise money for uh, uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, awareness and support. 
Um, this is a, a, a picture of uh, uh, a portion of our group. We have a large digestive care center in southern Indiana. In fact, we're probably the largest medical group in southern Indiana. And our group is made up of the four general, uh, four colorectal surgeons you can see here, uh, as well as the general surgeon. And, uh, and I think we've got 12 gastroenterologists, so we have quite a comprehensive uh, GI center. We take care of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, uh, obviously colorectal cancer screening and treatment. Um, uh, incontinence. Uh, we have a full-time nutritionist that helps us uh, uh, with managing our patients as well. And uh, what, what I'm going to talk about is small bowel, or I shouldn't say small, I'm going to talk about bowel obstruction. And Dr. Martin was just, uh, had just alluded a little bit to uh, obstruction and nutrition. And um, before I get started, I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate a couple of the things that she said. And, and something that's very important and something that I emphasize to all my patients before we get into doing surgery is, is, is the aspect of both pre-surgical and post-surgical nutrition. So, you know, I really emphasized our patients to be eating a good, well-balanced diet, and, and by that I mean a good diet, not potato chips and corn chips and that kind of stuff, eating a good, well-balanced diet going into surgery. And unlike the old days, and I'm old enough that I remember these days, uh, we really start people eating right away after surgery. As she showed you, we start people on ice chips or clear liquids uh, literally uh, as soon as they get back to the floor after their surgery. And over one to two days, uh, we try to advance them to a regular diet as quickly as possible. We've actually found that contrary to what we believed 20 years ago, that people absolutely should not be fed immediately after surgery, that in fact they do better. You know, as she mentioned, the entire GI tract is important in nutrition, and the entire GI tract is important in the overall function of the body. The GI tract secretes a lot of neural hormones and, and, uh, um, uh, and neurotransmitters that are important in just the overall bodily function. So, in fact, we found that patients do better and have fewer complications if they can eat after surgery. Not everyone can eat. Some people do get sick. Some people do have early post-op obstruction but probably 90% of people can, can uh, begin eating right away after surgery, and so we've become quite aggressive um, in, in the more modern era, so to speak, in, in advancing diets. And this has really helped us in, in the uh, overall comfort and, 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 and progress of our patients postoperatively. So having said that, um, I'm going to talk about those difficult issues that we face with, with bowel obstruction. And when we talk about bowel obstruction, again, as Dr. Martin mentioned, the the, the, the the intestinal tract is made up of, uh, you know, begins, begins with the mouth and ends with the uh, anal canal and rectum. Uh, but when we think about bowel obstructions, we're talking about uh, the, the small bowel and the colon. Um, small bowel obstruction is much more common than, than, um, than colonic obstruction because colon cancer is the most common cause of colon obstruction. And yet colon cancer presents as an obstructing tumor in only 2 to 3 percent of the cases. Um, and that has to do a lot with the fact that, that, that we, we do have a large percentage of the population now undergoing appropriate screening. And patients generally get in to see a physician and have some type of diagnostic procedure performed fairly early on if they're having symptoms. And so we don't see obstructing colon cancer very often. So that means that by far and away, small bowel obstruction is the most common type of obstruction that we see. And what we're talking about here is not obstruction, you know, that we have in the immediate post-op period when a patient gets sick and they're throwing up. That, that we call an ileus. And an ileus is a type of obstruction, but an ileus refers to the fact that the gut's just not working well. And, it, and it's not working well after surgery because we've created an injury. And for that matter, any significant injury to the body can cause an ileus, which, which means the gut just becomes paralyzed for a period of time. And this was the big reason that we didn't feed people, you know, before the past 10 to 15 years. Patients just were not fed after surgery until they started passing gas. A a a an old theory that I learned when I was doing my surgery residency and my colorectal residency was don't feed them until they fart. So we basically withheld any significant food for patients until they started passing gas. And that might have been four or five days down the road. In fact, we know now that they tend to pass gas a lot sooner if you do feed them. So uh, so we're talking here not about an ileus, I digressed a little bit there, but we're not talking about the, the post-op ileus that, that occurs after surgery. We're talking about obstructions that occur well after surgery in most cases. 
And so small bowel obstruction consists of the complete or partial uh, occlusion of the, the small bowel itself. And the, the most common cause of this, as you can see, is adhesions, which we'll talk about in a minute. With, with cancer being a, 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 a very small minority uh, of the cases of patients who present with obstruction, uh, abdominal wall hernias uh, can be a cause, as you can see, in about 10%. And inflammatory condi conditions like we see with Crohn's disease or diverticulitis or abscesses of any kind um, account for just a very small percentage of patients who present with an intestinal obstruction. Uh, to talk a little bit about e each of those categories, adhesions can occur after any surgery. And, um, you know, the, the, the discussion I'm having today is maybe a little more detailed, but not a lot more detailed than the discussion I have with patients who come in with an obstruction. Anyone who's had a surgery can develop an adhesion, and an adhesion consists basically of, of, of usually a, a kind of a very thin, filmy area of scar tissue that can develop between loops of bowel or between the bowel and the abdominal wall. And, and they're very common. It, they're very unpredictable. People can have significant surgeries and not develop adhesions. They can have a hernia operation as, a, as an infant and develop a, a, an adhesion uh, with a potential obstruction decades after they had their surgery. But adhesions are more common, we think, with extensive surgeries or people who have had multiple surgeries. Adhesions seem to be, seem to be more of a problem with pelvic surgeries. And, and when we're talk, talking about the patients I take care of, people have colon surgeries. Uh, that, that being because a colon surgery usually involves resection of a, a, a fairly significant length of the bowel and, and therefore the potential for more injury within the abdominal cavity. Um, obstruction occurs when you have adhesions because of twisting uh, or torsion of the bowel. And, and I always say to patients, think of a garden hose you know, that you take and you kink it off, uh, that hose becomes obstructed. And, and not only does it become instructed, but there's a potential of having compromise of the blood supply to the bowel, which is one of the things that can make a bowel obstruction um, much, more, much more serious than it already is. Um, and, and so the way I explain this to patients is, that, is normally your, your bowel is normally moving. You don't realize that, but it's, it's normally undergoing peristalsis. It's moving things through. You don't sense that. Your bowel doesn't really have pain fibers to, to the, the way that your skin does. So the bowel is always moving. When, when you move around, your bowel moves. That's one of the ways we, we obtain exposure when we're doing laparoscopic or robotic surgery. We can't get our hands in the abdominal cavity in that case. So, so we use gravity to move the bowel around. So the bowel is always in motion. And so if you have a, a loop of bowel that is not only attached in the belly cavity by its mesentery, but also becomes attached to the abdominal wall because of an adhesion or to another loop of bowel because of an adhesion, there's a potential for it to rotate and twist on itself, and then that results in, that results in obstruction. Um, when we talk about tumors causing obstruction, metastatic tumors are the most common cause of obstructions, and the reason I say that is because small bowel obstruction is the most, type of, most common type of obstruction that we see, but small bowel cancers are very rare. In, in 25 years of practice, I've only seen two. Uh, so therefore, most tumors that are causing, and when I say tumors, I mean cancer here, most cancers that cause obstruction are metastatic cancers. The most common sites within the belly are from the ovaries, the pancreas, the stomach, the colon. And we're not talking about obstruction of the colon here. We're talking about a small bowel obstruction that results from a, a metastatic cancer. The most common extra, or com, I should say common, not to say most common, although the first two are most common, the most common extra abdominal cancers uh, that, that can cause uh, obstruction or from the lung and from the breast because they commonly um, uh, metastasize to the liver and, and potentially to uh, within the abdominal cavity. The obstruction could be caused by just direct compression of the bowel if the tumor is growing on the outside or they can actually grow into the, uh, the lumen of the bowel and in the inside of the bowel which can cause uh, compression or they can also serve as a point that fixes the bowel to the abdominal wall or to another organ so that it can twist, and in these cases, you, you, you have obstruction. Hernia cause um, obstruction by getting a loop of bowel uh, stuck within the hernia. And I think most people know what hernia are, but uh, hernia are they're defects in, the, in the, the fascia of the abdominal. The fascia is kind of that tough bristle that holds everyone in, every, or holds everyone, holds, holds the bowel within the belly cavity. It's not the skin, the muscles, the fat. And, and I think everybody's probably familiar with groin hernia or umbilical hernia. Those are, those are commonly occurring hernias. 
But anytime we do surgery, we create a hernia. When we create an ostomy, like a colostomy, we create a hernia because we've, cr we've created an opening in the abdominal wall. So old incisions are, are, are areas where people can develop hernia because you've got kind of a, an unnatural weakness, and we see, we see uh, incisional hernias quite often in our patients who have had surgery, even those who've had laparoscopic surgery sometimes. So if you get a loop of bile that, that, that gets stuck up through that hernia, uh, of course, it, you know, it, it, it's going to undergo compression, it can twist, <clears throat> and that causes obstruction. And, and just like with, with uh, obstruction inside the belly, uh, belly you, can, you can get restriction of blood flow. Inflammatory conditions that, cause, um, that can cause obstruction. Crohn's disease is probably the most common. Ulcerative colitis less, less commonly. And, uh, and, 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 and diverticulitis, which I think used to be a, a more common cause of obstruction, we don't see much anymore. Because generally speaking, if people have had recurrent episodes of diverticulitis, most often they've had a, a, they've had a surgery prior to developing a chronic stricture caused by the recurrent episodes uh, of diverticulitis. Because any condition that, re that, that results in recurrent episodes of inflammation uh, is going to cause potential scarring. Any kind of an injury, even surgical injuries, which are controlled injuries, uh, uh, heal by scarring, and, and, and that development of scar can, can, can cause uh, uh, strictures. So the majority of, of obstructions are caused, as I said, by, by adhesions between loops of the bowel and the abdominal wall, or loops of bowel with one another, and, and you get twisting or entrapment of the bowel, um, which, which uh, um, then, then uh, results in obstruction. Most of the time it involves a small bowel, and something that's of particular importance to patients who have undergone a, a, a colon cancer operation is that when these patients present with an obstruction, most of the time, it's just simply from an adhesion. It's not recurrent cancer. And that's actually something, that's, a, that's an actual point that we have a hard time getting across to clinicians because a lot of times if a hospitalist admits a patient or one of the primary care physicians has a patient with an obstruction, and if they have a history of colon cancer, they kind of automatically assume that it's a colon cancer. And what we know is that in the majority of cases that's not true. It's a simple adhesion. So the clinical presentation of people with the bowel obstruction, the, the, the three classic, the three classic uh, uh, parts of the presentation are the first three lines there. A patient presents a crampy abdominal pain, abdominal distension, and, and then as it progresses, they get nausea and vomiting. Those are the, those are the three cardinal hallmarks of, of obstruction, you know, pain, uh, distension, and, and, and nausea with vomiting. Obstipation means that the person is not passing any stool or gas. That may not happen at first because when, a, when, a, when a, an obstruction first occurs, in fact, the bowel usually is going to be hyperactive, and they may actually pass what stools in the colon. Um, but if you get a day or two down the road, generally the, pe the patient's not going to pass any, any stool or gas anymore. Uh, something to be very aware of, however, is that partial obstruction will actually cause loose frequent stool, so the pe people will get diarrhea. And that's something we see with partially obstructing colon cancers. In fact, that's why the most common symptom of, uh, of a cancer within the colon, if it's causing symptoms, will be loose frequent stool because they're partially obstructed. And uh, uh, anybody who likes rocket science, that's a Bernoulli principle. But that's something we see with, with uh, inflammatory conditions sometimes, with radiation, or, or with partially obstructing tumors, is that patients actually get loose frequent stool. They'll also have crampy abdominal pain, distension, and, and nausea uh, or vomiting. So when we evaluate these patients, when a person comes into the emergency room and they come into my office, you know, we do a history and physical examination, and we're generally going to find that they've got abdominal distension, they've got crampy pain, it's generally not constant pain, constant pain is kind of a bad sign to get crampy pain, and they typically have an increase, what we call hyperactive bowel sounds early on. Uh, also important in doing their physical examination is to look for scars, because obviously that, that, that indicates they've had surgery, and it, it can indicate the presence of adhesion. We also look for hernia, groin hernias and velcro hernias, uh, hernias in old surgical scars. And typically, if a person has an incarcerated hernia, it will be very apparent and very uh, palpable um, by the physician. In terms of uh, uh, an examination to confirm our, our diagnosis, a plain abdominal x-ray is all that's needed in most cases. And we do something called an upright KUB. That's an old term that referred to kidney or uh, Kidney, ureter, and bladder for some reason, but just doing an upright, plain x-ray will show us distended loops of bowel and fluid levels, just like in a carpenter's level, and, we, and you can make the diagnosis on that. 
anymore, and this is a kind of a critique I have of, the, of, of, our, of our medical system, a patient can't hardly get through the emergency department doors without having a CT scan. And CT scans are very good at showing obstruction. But, but in most cases, they're really not needed. A good history physical exam and an upright x-ray, which is a lot less expensive, will make the diagnosis. We sometimes use x-ray studies, barium studies, in people who have intermittent obstructions. In other words, they, 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 they seem to develop obstruction, clears by itself, obstruction clears by itself. Our patients, we, we suspect a partial obstruction. And when patients come in with an obstruction, we do some basic laboratory studies. The CBC stands for a blood count. The CMP stands for just metabolic, you know, electrolyte studies, an EKG, a urinalysis. And we do those things to uh, evaluate, you know, the state of hydration of the patient. And, and, and we, we, we want to we have a good baseline set of laboratory studies, including EKG. I didn't put chest x-ray up there, but that's important in case the patient needs surgery. Uh, the initial treatment, however, is IV fluid support because quite often people are dehydrated. The average person doesn't make their way to the emergency department as soon as they're sick because, in fact, a lot of different things can, can make a person sick and have nausea and vomiting, as, as, as anyone listening to this will realize. Um, so generally speaking, they, they don't get in the emergency department until they've been at home for hours or sometimes a day or two, and, and they, they can be significantly hydrated. So IV fluid support and Correction of electrolytes is important. Um, we, too, we do tube decompression, and anybody uh, watching this out there who's been through this knows what I mean. We put a tube down your nose, into your stomach to decompress the, uh, the gut. Because by doing those two things, fluid support, rehydrating the patient, decompressing the gut to, to relieve the pressure, that buys us time. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the, uh, the, the, the last thing on, on, on the list is, is surgery. We do surgery when indicated. Uh, medical treatment involves monitoring the patient very closely, doing repeat examinations, watching their urine output, checking their vital signs. Uh, we know that over 50% of people who present with a small bowel obstruction uh, will have resolution. And patients ask me all the time, well, well, how did that happen? And I say, you know, I don't know how it happened. We don't know why you suddenly developed this, this, this twisting of your bowel. And we, but, but I always tell people, whatever it was that happened that caused it to twist, um, that, again, the bowel is always in motion. Uh, if we can decompress it, we can give the person some, some fluid support. And over 50% of the, patient, the, the patients, it, it, it will resolve on its own. Um, if it does not, you know, then, then we, we, we have to make a decision about surgery. And generally speaking, um, if the person doesn't show some signs of improvement, start passing a little bit of gas, uh, cramping getting better, um, within 24, 48 hours, we start thinking about taking them to the, to the operating room. And just to tell you how much our thought process has also changed since I first started practice, I was taught as a general surgery resident that you never let the sun rise or set on a bowel obstruction. And what that meant was that when a patient came into the hospital and you made the diagnosis, you, you, did, you did surgery within 24 hours. In other words, if they came in in the morning, you did it before the sun went down. If they came in at night, you did it before the sun, sun came up unless they opened up. We know that that was jumping the gun a little bit. We no longer do that because we do know that the majority of people will open up on their own. Of course, surgery is indicated in anybody who shows deterioration. And by that, I mean they start showing signs of an acute surgical abdomen where the, where the pain is no longer kind of mild and diffuse or crampy, but they get, they get what we call a rigid abdomen where they, they have excruciating pain uh, that could indicate that they've got dead bowel. And, and I, I mentioned that a negative expiration is sometimes better than waiting because we don't have a good handle based on our physical examination when the patient may have a, a loop of bowel that has, has died. Now, we will eventually, and that's why I say sometimes the next negative expiration is better than waiting. If you wait long enough, a piece of bowel that's lost its blood supply and has become what we call necrotic, which means it's dead, it's going to perforate. By that time, the patient's going to be really sick if you operate on them. So if, if, a, if a surgeon has any question at all that that patient's not improving, it's been more than 24, 48 hours, uh, sometimes better off to take a look um, and be wrong than, than to wait. Um, what, this kind of leads to the, to the first line in, in this next slide on surgery. Laparoscopic surgery is sometimes possible in patients with uh, a small bowel obstruction. Quite often, it's not possible, however, because the bowel is quite distended. And, and one of the keys to doing laparoscopic surgery is having exposure. And if the bowel is very distended, it, it, it's very difficult to, uh, to get 
to, 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 get, to develop any space between the abdominal wall and the bowel uh, when we put CO2 in to try to do the laparoscopic surgery. Now, I know that may be getting a little bit technical, but just suffice it to say we, we, if the bowel is very, very distended, we, we sometimes can't get good exposure laparoscopically. Uh, the surgery for most people with a small bowel obstruction when you take them to surgery is just a simple lysis of the adhesion that's causing the surgery. Quite often it involves making a relatively small incision. You trace the bowel, you know, starting from the stomach down to the point where there's a transition area. So the bowel is distended above that point. You get below that point and you can see this normal size. You, you, you find that usually there's an adhesion. Usually you'll see the obvious rotation or it may be stuck under an adhesion. And all you do is break that adhesion with your fingers or, or sniff it and you're done. That's all there is to the surgery. It quite often takes longer to take the person to the operating room and return them back to the room than it does to do the surgery, which is one of the reasons years ago surgeons were much more aggressive about operating than, 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 than we are now because, because the, the, the surgery is usually quite easy to do. However, since we know that, 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 that the majority of people will get better without surgery, we still try to hold off on doing that because surgery of any kind is serious. And anybody's had surgery, realizes that. So even though from a surgical standpoint we find it easy to do, uh, to, to do an operation in lice and adhesion, it still represents significant injury to the patient. So we, we, we like not to do that if we don't have to. If a person has a, a hernia, we, we reduce the hernia and, and repair the hernia. Um, anytime we find bowel that's not viable, in other words, it's, it's dead because of it, it's been obstructed long enough that we've had uh, compromise the blood supply, we, we have to take that segment out. And, we, and we, as I mentioned before, we, we like to make a decision to operate um, before it gets to that point. Uh, in patients who have metastatic cancer, and let's say they have a, a large area of radiation that's caused a, 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 a very long stricture, uh, in those cases we may not try to resect the bowel. In fact, it may not be possible to resect it in people with metastatic cancer, but we will try to, to bypass if need be. Uh, we will resect if possible. In people with Crohn's disease, with, with strictures, we, if, it's a, if it's a short area, we will resect it. If it's a long area, we do something called a stricture plasty, which is basically it, it's, a, it's a way of opening up the narrow area. And by stricture, I mean an area where the bowel is narrow. Um, and, and, and patients who have had recurrent episodes of diverticulitis and have a stricture, we resect, we do a sigmoid colon resection. We resect that portion of the bowel. So those, are just, those are just the common approaches to surgery. Uh, the very special cases that we have to pay attention to, and Dr. Martin mentioned this early, uh, earlier, is early post-op. And early post-op obstruction, and, and I mentioned this as well, is, is that's, that's an ileus, and that's a physiologic obstruction. Um, and, and to give you a very practical example of that, I saw one of my partner's patients this morning who's nine days after having a laparoscopic colon resection for surgery, and he's still not passing gas, his belly distended, and we've had to put a tube down his stomach. He, he doesn't have a mechanical obstruction. He is obstructed, but it's an early post-op obstruction, it's, and we know that it's physiologic, and we basically just, we're just going to support him with fluid and electrolyte support and wait it out because those tend to open up. And, and, uh, and even in people who develop a, 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 what we call a mechanical obstruction because of an adhesion, it's extremely rare in people within the first month of surgery. So, Early post-op people, we, we really are conservative about taking them back to the operating room. Um, we also are very conservative and really wait things out in people who have had multiple surgeries for obstruction because quite often in these patients, uh, if, they've had, if they've had multiple surgeries for obstruction, they quite often have multiple dense adhesions and quite often even getting into the belly can create further injury and quite often it can be difficult to find the, the exact point of obstruction. So we really wait a while on people like this. And these are people where we sometimes might do a barium study ahead of time to kind of help target the area we need to look at. In patients who have known metastatic cancer uh, and, and where we suspect that the metastatic cancer is causing their obstruction, we also take a very conservative course with them because we know quite often if we open them up, there may not be much that we can do. So we will wait and wait and wait to see if they will open up on their own before automatically jumping back in and doing surgery. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, of course, the patients with radiation as well. Um, so those are very special cases that, you know, where, where we don't follow the automatic, you know, the protocol that we follow for a patient coming in with a suspected uh, uh, a small bowel obstruction from, from a simple adhesion. Again, to go back to colon cancer patients, and these are the great majority of patients that I see with a bowel obstruction are my patients who have had colon resections, most often for colon cancer. 
we know that there's, a, there's, a, there's greater than a 15% risk of developing at least one small bowel obstruction over the lifetime of a patient who's had a colon resection. Um, we wonder if there's less risk of that with laparoscopic surgery. And, and I will tell you now that, that, that uh, four of the five of my partners, uh, we do laparoscopic surgery as our preferred approach. We do laparoscopic or, or we sometimes do uh, robotic surgery in the case of our, of our rectal cancers. But, but we do minimally invasive surgery, and that's our preferred approach. And, there, and there's been some question in the literature whether our minimally invasive surgeries, because they tend to cause less injury within the belly cavity, might be associated with a lower uh, risk of adhesion and obstruction. But there's no clear-cut evidence of that at this point. Um, we know that partial obstruction, and, and this really gets to where diet can be important in patients, because I mentioned before, we've gotten pretty aggressive about advancing diets and letting people eat pretty much what they want to. You know, uh, Dr. Martin mentioned keeping a log and seeing what bothers you. That's the advice, I, the advice I've given to all my patients when they go home. Is I say, you know, pay attention to, to eat a good balanced diet. To use the, the small meals, I tell them to graze. I say, I don't, I, you know, you don't have to eat just three square meals a day. Just graze if you want to. But make sure you're getting adequate nutrition. Eat a good balanced diet. Um, and, 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 and if something bothers you, stay away from it. If it doesn't bother you, it's okay to eat it. Um, but we do know that, that, that when we do an anastomosis, and, and just to, 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 so you know what an, a, the anastomosis is, that's the joint where we put the bowel back together. And we always get some partial obstruction at an anastomosis. And it can be particularly bothersome with our rectal anastomoses, those that we do low in the pelvis. So people always have some degree of partial obstruction when we do that. And early on in my practice, I would have my patients coming in where I had done a right colectomy and I'd put the small bowel to the colon, and they'd be complaining about getting cramping or getting discomfort over on the right side. And, and as a young surgeon, I'd get worried, oh, my God, if they got recurrent cancer, and I would scan them. And, and I, always found, I always found they were okay. I, I never found a problem. So, you know, I now kind of tell patients, you know, that area of the bowel is not going to expand like it normally would. The bowel is usually very soft. It can expand. Where that anastomosis is isn't going to do that for some period of time. And it can be anywhere from weeks to several years. So. So, so the, the, our anastomoses, and, and as you'll see at the bottom of my list there, an ostomy can both represent areas of partial obstruction. And, and that's where, and I've learned that from patients. That wasn't something I was taught. So patients sometimes have to watch what they put in because, as Dr. Martin said, it may not come through, you know. But, but getting back to one of her initial points is that I, I tell people to kind of keep track of stuff, and, and I encourage them to, to eat what they're comfortable with, and if it doesn't cause them problems, to go ahead and eat it. And, and, and the majority of people uh, can do that. Um, but but it, it's interesting what I've learned from patients through the years, and in particular what I've learned since my wife's been involved with the Cohen Club, and I've been able to spend a lot of time on, uh, around young cancer survivors. It's kind of opened my eyes to the problems that can occur that quite often patients don't tell you about, and that quite often we don't focus on because we tend to, how you doing? You know, are you eating okay? What's your weight? When we say eating okay, you know, we weigh them, you know, make sure they're not dropping their weight off. So as clinicians, sometimes we get more concerned about are they having any, you know, serious problems as a result of their surgery? or the, Is there any evidence that they've got recurrent cancer? And we tend to not focus on the small things. So I've learned a lot, uh, you know, from young cancer survivors, my, my, uh, my, uh, my cancer survivors of any age, and uh, from my wife and some of the other associated health uh, care workers I, I, I've been around in the last uh, 10 years or so. So prevention. Um, there's, there's no proven method of prevention. And, and, and one of the things patients always ask me if they've been in and, the, and, and they're over a bowel obstruction, whether they've had surgery or it's gotten better on its own, is what can I do to prevent this? And, and other than in those special circumstances where we feel like maybe the, uh, the anastomosis or the ostomy is, is causing some issue with, with just mechanical obstruction, you know, I tell them there's, there's nothing you can do. You know, when you talk about just the, 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 the small bowel obstruction caused by an adhesion, which is the most common cause of obstruction, we don't know why people get them. You know, I, I use a line from, from an old movie, Bad Luck, you know, an old Western. Uh, it's just bad luck. It's nothing that they did. And, and I think we as humans always want to try to figure out what did I do to cause me to have this. And, and there's, there, there, there's not a simple answer. And, and that's a tough thing to tell patients because, you know, Quite often, if they're traveling out of the country or they're going backpacking or whatever, you know, this can happen at any time, and that's not what somebody wants to hear, and yet, you know, that's, that's the truth of the matter. 
uh, from our standpoint, you know, there's, there's been a lot of emphasis on minimizing the injury of the surgery. And as, as I mentioned, doing, doing our cases minimally invasive, which is, which is our, our preferred method right now, uh, we hope that in years to come we'll see that, that, that maybe there's a lower instance of obstruction, but I, I, there's no hard data to show that. And, and as I said before, we see people who come in, that we'll see people come in with an obstruction at, at the age of 60 who had an appendectomy when they were five years old. So that's pretty minimal surgery and yet could still result in an obstruction at some point in their life. And, and then, and then my, my, the, my last point is that, that you know, there's no, it's not directly caused by diet or activity. So, Somebody wants to play softball like I do, or they want to golf, or they want to ice skate, or they want to, they want to backpack. Their activity is not causing this, and 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 there's no direct one-to-one -one cause with diet, except in those special circumstances that we've that we've talked about today. So, in summary, most obstructions, most most bowel obstructions that we see are caused by adhesions, uh, and and it's generally the small bowel. Uh, we know that there's at least a 15 percent risk of people developing a, an obstruction at some point in their lifetime after a colon resection. Most, most uh, obstructions respond to conservative treatment and surgeries are reserved to those people who don't improve or those people who, who present with an incarcerated hernia or an acute surgical abdomen that, that do need uh, uh, immediate treatment. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Now we're going to begin the question and answer session. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. So, um, Margaret, this question is for you. Um, if you could expand on posture. Um, so, any tips versus sitting versus standing? Um, anything else you'd like to add about posture? Well, posture is important to help um, your esophagus to fully receive the food. Um, so many times I see people when they don't feel well lean back on the couch or, or on the chair to try to eat. So sitting up in a chair, if you can, prop with pillows after surgery is always a good idea. And um, it lets you interact with other people at the meal, too, and just take your time and eat and chew every bite. Great. Thank you. So, Dr. Waller, um, we have a question. Um, if you are um, a CRC survivor um, or have had some sort of colon surgery and there's signs of obstruction, when should you seek medical help? Well, that, you know, that becomes a judgment call. And uh, what I will, uh, I'll just tell you what I tell people over the phone when you know, it's one of the calls we, we can get in the evening sometimes from patients. You know, when someone first starts feeling abdominal distension and cramping and vomiting, 
Um, it, it's certainly possible they just got an upset stomach, they've got the flu. And what I tell them to do is to, um, you know, just stop eating solid stuff, but, but just sip on liquids um, and pay attention to whether they're passing gas. Okay, that's the most important thing. Uh, a lot of times we focus on the stool, but a lot of times there can be residual stool, for that matter, some, some gas in the colon, uh, that you, 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 but you may not pass the stool. So, you know, I, I tell them give themselves 12 hours or so. And uh, if their symptoms are worsening, if they're not passing any gas um, or, or stool, but again, I really haven't paid attention to the gas, then I want them to come in. You know, and that, and that may mean um, if, they're, if, it's during, if it's during office hours and, and I can see them in the office, come to the office first. If it's after hours, I may have them go into the emergency department so we can do that flat plate upright abdominal x-ray to see if there's signs of obstruction. So I kind of use 12 hours as, as a, you know, paying, paying attention to whether they're passing stool or gas because if we get to where they're having diarrhea and they're passing gas, it may just be the flu. Um, but it's always, it, it, it's, uh, it's a judgment call that has to be made between the physician and, and that individual patient. And, and some of it depends on their history. If they've had issues before, you, you know, you might be a little more concerned and get them in a little bit sooner. But I usually give them a chance to see if it's going to pass on their own at home and just encourage them to try to, as long as they're not just throwing up every single thing that they drink, to try to keep themselves hydrated. Thank you. Um, for you again, Dr. Raleigh, this is just a clarification question. Um, Someone was asking, do you or don't you rush into surgery for obstruction? Uh, they said they understand the need to wait because it will open up on its own, but what about the um, concern about having a dead bowel? Well, that's, that's, that's the reason that the old adage was out there that you never let the sun rise or set on a bowel obstruction, that you, um, you put them in, you hydrate, you get them hydrated, you know, correct their electrolytes, do their baseline laboratory stuff, and then if they had to start passing gas, you took them to the operating room. And, and I used to book people from surgery on my way in to see them. You know, the emergency room physician would call, and they would, they would, they would have done the initial uh, examination and the x-ray, and I'd call the operating room. So when I first started in practice 20, 25 years ago, that's what I did. Um, what, we, what we now know is that if you put a, a nasogastric tube down to help decompress the gut and you hydrate, you buy yourself time. And, and so that's why we will wait 24, 48 hours. Um, Assuming that they, they appear to be getting better, you know, if there's any question, then we go to the operating room. So we're not nearly as quick to take them to the operating room across the board, surgeons across the board, as we once were. But, but that is a real concern. There's not a, you know, in, unless the person, person is, is, is a, a, a piece of bowel that is just, it, it's become, it's, 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 it's necrotic and it perforates, are you going to have that, the, the presentation with what we call an acute abdomen? And, and so that's a little bit uh, of the risk. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why, you know, historically we operated on patients very quickly. But again, just looking at the data that we have now and realizing that, that over half of them will open on their own, we, we, I think all surgeons tend to give them a little more time now than we used to. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Margaret, there was a question on specific foods, um, and this came in prior to the webinar, um, but have you heard anything about pineapple or coconut specifically causing trouble with obstruction? Well, pineapple is very fibrous and has a lots of, um, people may see strings in them, and it's, um, pineapple's hard to digest for some people anyway. Coconut is a fibrous food. So some people find they're not able to use those, you know, if they have diverticulitis or a problem with um, repeat irritation of the bowel. So I wouldn't recommend them if, if you think that that causes pain, you know, an hour or two after eating. Okay. Thank you. So would you be able to, Margaret, to just briefly um, – direct us back to the resources specifically for colorectal cancer patients. Uh, do you have a couple that you would um, recommend that colorectal cancer patients look at? Oh, absolutely. Um, on our website, mypearlpoint.org, we have several articles on <clears throat> colon cancer. The first one is, I have colon cancer, what should I eat? That's a great one. Um, another great article on my Pearl Point is 
I have had colon surgery, what should I eat? And that also includes some information on fiber. And then our new, I guess our newest additions to the website are a five-day menu of low residue, low fiber foods in our colorectal uh, cancer survivor handbook. I think that's um, very helpful. And then, of course, the National uh, American Cancer Society has a lot of good information about low fiber foods. If you just type that in their uh, search field, as does the National Cancer Institute. Um, I think those are are three really good sources. Thank you. Dr. Waller, we had a question come in. If you could uh, explain specifically what an adhesion is. Yeah, an adhesion, uh, uh, interesting term. I don't know where we came up with that. But, um, <laughs> you know, any, as, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned at one point during the talk, any, any kind of an injury to the body uh, results in an inflammatory process and then, and then uh, scarring. I mean, if you look at scars on your skin, that's what you see. We tend to not get dense scarring like that within the abdominal cavity, but, but it, it represents an area where there was inflammation caused by, uh, in most cases, we're talking about surgery. And so you will have, um, the, the bowel normally is attached to the back part of the abdominal cavity by what's called the mesentery and the blood vessels and nerves and the lymphatics are contained in the mesentery. So the bowel is normally attached along what we call the mesenteric border. And, and, the, other, and the other part of the bowel is free. So the bowel can, it can move around, it does move around within the belly cavity. So if you get this, this, this uh, you know, because of, of an inflammatory process, you get um, the bowel stuck to another loop of bowel by, by an area of, of scar, something that's not naturally there, or stuck to the abdominal wall. Uh, again, by by scarring, then we call that an adhesion, and and I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm sure it's because the the first anatomists or surgeons looking in the belly thought, well, look, this is it's adhesed to this other structure; it doesn't belong there, you know, and so that's what it amounts to. And the interesting thing about about uh, about adhesions is that we we can we, we we can operate on people. We used to think I'll just give you laparoscopy as an example. We used to to think that one of the contraindications of doing laparoscopy was that people have had some belly surgery before, but we now know that that's not necessarily so because we, we see people who have maybe had ex extensive surgeries, um, and yet when we put a laparoscope in, they've got no adhesion. And again, I, I've mentioned the, the hernia repair or the appendectomy. We'll see if other patients who have had very minimal surgery, and they'll have several uh, uh, they'll have several areas of the bowel that are that are scarred together or scarred up against the abdominal wall. So it's very unpredictable as to who, who's going to develop adhesions. But that, that's basically what they are. They're, they're abnormal attachments consisting of, of scar tissue between the bowel and either other loops of bowel or organs, the liver, for instance, or the abdominal wall. Thank you. So we've had a couple of questions come in, I think, just further clarifying. Um, perhaps, Dr. Roller, you can begin answering this question, um, and then we can see if Margaret has anything additional to add. Um, but is there anything to keep a bowel obstruction from reoccurring? Well, in the, in, in the case of adhesions, there's not, you know, and um, it's not what you're eating. It, it's not what you're doing. You know, there, there's not, that, that's not the issue. Um, so there's, there, the, the, the simple answer is there's, not, there's no way you can prevent those. Now, uh, when you talk about, you know, having a, an area where you, where you may have some, some chronic narrowing, like where we put the bowel back together, where you have an ostomy, if you have a colostomy or an ileostomy, um, then, you know, it, it's, like, it's like Margaret was saying and, and I was saying earlier, if you eat certain things, you know, we, we know that if, if something can cause, just if it mechanically won't go through there and it plugs it up, it can give you trouble. So it, that's, that's a matter of just kind of, you know, keep, keeping track of those foods which tend to do that to you and being aware of which foods are going to have more bulk and, and, and pass undigested into the colon and potentially give you trouble. Margaret, do you have anything else to add related to that? Oh, I agree fully with Dr. Waller. I think, um, you know, your body is your body and you know sometimes which, what's going to happen if you eat something. Keeping records really help and sharing that with your doctor, but there's really no way to prevent an obstruction. 
Thank you very much. Let me see if there are any additional questions coming in. So we do have a general question um, about oncology nutrition, and we do have time to go ahead and answer this question. Um, so, Margaret, would you recommend resources for foods to eat um, that would help with neuropathy? Well, neuropathy is usually a physiological condition. You know, it's a nerve damage, um, so there's not really a nutritional treatment for for that. There are safety things to do, you know, if your hands have neuropathy, you know, trying to really be careful with hot foods and things of that nature. If it's from diabetes, you know, trying to be in the best management of your diabetes that you can be, but there's really no known food to help neuropathy that I'm aware of. Thank you. So what we will do, everyone, um, is we will be posting a few follow-up question and answers on our website. You will be able to find these slides on our website if you go to fightcholorectalcancer.org slash webinars. We'll post these after that. So I just wanted to thank both of our presenters today for their time. We really appreciate it. I think we've had some really great discussion, and we look forward to following up with some additional posts and some additional information on oncology nutrition and then bowel blockages in the future. So thank you very much to both of you. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you for asking. Abby, are you on? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Yes, Bye I am. Abby. Hi. We really appreciate Bye. you all the time to do the presentation, and we are going to follow up with some blog posts, so we will be in touch. But thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you both. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Did Dr. Waller stay on? No, I, I, I accidentally cut him off. That's okay. We will follow up with him. All right. All right, so, so I think gone. it's just, just us. Is Danielle on? No. She is, but she's offline is what it says. Got it. So I can't uh, really dismiss her. Um, yeah, start. the only trouble I had with the platform was when I was trying to switch to the question page after Dr. Waller. It kept on switching the order, and I kept on remuting myself, which was ridiculous. Is that what was going on? Yeah, I, was, I couldn't figure out. Am I going, did I do something? Was it me? Did I? No, so it was I, me. So, like, when I hit myself as a presenter, it kept on moving me down at the same time I was trying to click unmute, and I oh, couldn't geez. tell, like, what was happening. So, anyway, it was, I couldn't tell what, I was talking the whole time, and clearly no one heard me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because Danielle's like, it's like I can hear you. I'm like, I was like, yeah, I can hear me too. Because it was like every time I kind of shuffle and move something, I can hear it in my ears. I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa! I shouldn't be on. Why am I on? Yeah. Uh, so, so I thought maybe you had uh, 
changed me to presenter, and I, I was like, it's like, it's like telling my telling my account, no, don't be the presenter. Oh um, yeah, it was the um, stupid.